Hello, welcome to my summary of 4,000 words by Michael Berkman. So I'm doing these summaries because I do a lot of reading. I love reading. It's really helped change my life. And I know that a lot of people don't have the time. They're unable to make the time that they would benefit from. And so it helps me to learn better. And it means that I can help people out here to absorb lessons from the books, absorb hopefully the lessons that I've learned and to see things from a different perspective. And this book, well, today we're going to go over the book overview, the problems facing us, why the title 4,000 Week came about, highlights, best bits that I've picked up and some of the, the relevance and the things that I see being useful to people listening to this. And then a summary of what we can take from the book. So in overview, time management is destined to fail because life requires sacrifice. And what makes life better is the fact that we must approach this realistically. And the fact that we have to pick and choose between the things that we want to do is what makes life so valuable. The 4,000 weeks comes from the average lifespan that we have. And it's written by Oliver Berkman, who is somebody who has tried to battle with time management, which is something that really resonated with me. I read it because I wanted to improve my time management. And actually, the book helped me see things from a different perspective. So let's get stuck right in. I referenced the page numbers and the quotes are precise. So hopefully Oliver Berkman doesn't watch this and get angry or any of his PR team. Uh, but yeah, let's get stuck in. But in the first chapter, he talks about how busyness has been rebranded as hustle. Relentless work is not a burden to be endured, but as an exhilarating lifestyle choice that's worth boasting about on social media. And this was something that really resonated with me because I've always respected and admired that hustle side of things. You know, people who work 60 hours a week and build these big businesses. And actually, the reality of it is that that's not been the case for vast amounts of human history. You know, people, the purpose of being rich isn't so you can work more, it's so you can enjoy life. And ironically, as society has developed and people have got more money, and we now have more time saving tools we're still continuing to work, we're still continuing to do more and striving and reaching and looking for more money and more power and more respect and more likes and more followers and all those things. And the book kind of calls into question whether that's the right way to deal with things. It speaks about that once time is a resource to be used, you start to feel pressure. And one of the examples is if you think back hundreds of years and farmers who were just work the land and live in small tribes and communities is there wasn't pressure to maximize their time and once we started to track time once we started to become more aware of it and actually this is a concept that i've kind of struggled with and i often catch myself moving between the two is time is a man-made concept is that when we talk about not having enough time in relation to what there's a really famous billy Connolly joke when people say life is short name something longer you know, we have a huge amount of time. This pressure comes from our expectations and the amount that we try to cram in. It's not that time is short. It's not that there is this pressure. It's that we choose to add this pressure in. It becomes difficult not to value each moment primarily according to its usefulness for some future goal or some future oasis of relaxation you hope to reach once your tasks are finally out of the way. This is summarised me perfectly. This idea that once I get all my ducks in a row, I'll be able to take a step back and go on holiday and just be able to do things as I want. And that everything I'm doing today is for future benefit. Even reading the time management book and thinking about how can I help clients tomorrow? And there's this constant fascination and desire to live life in the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, the next decade, and completely miss the present moment. And this is something that I've been working on myself over the past year or so to be more present and to focus more on what's going on. But I'd never recognised that my desire to manage time was all about maximising tomorrow. And I hadn't really linked those things up. And I think a lot of people make the same mistake. I was using them, time management methods, to try to obtain a feeling of control over my life that would always remain out of reach. Another thing that struck kind of right at me, he listed off all these different time management things putting his day into 15 minute blocks, the Pomodoro technique, uh, I've forgotten a couple of the others, but I'd done them all because I believed, and I would say, you know, for a long time believed that actually if I could just get control over everything, then, then I would feel better, then I'd be happier with what was going on.
The convenience culture seduces us into imagining that we might find room for everything important by eliminating only life's tedious tasks. But it's a lie. You have to choose a few things, sacrifice everything else and deal with the inevitable sense of loss that results. It's very easy to look at our lives and think, well, do you know what? If I didn't scroll on my phone in the morning and I ate my lunch in 10 minutes and then on an evening I didn't watch TV and scroll through my phone, then I'd have time to exercise. I'd have time to tackle my side projects. I'd be able to see my friends more. I'd be able to make nicer meals. That's not how life works. We aren't machines. And even if you manage to control every moment of your life, there will still be more things that you want to do. There will still be more experiences to go out and experience. There was a good example from the book. He was talking about people with bucket lists and this idea of when I see this many places, I'll be happy. It's just not how it works. It's that idea of when I get a certain amount of money, I'll be happy. Or when I've slept with a certain amount of women, I'll be happy. When I make this achievement, then I'll be done and feel content and fulfilled. It's just not how life works. That's not how the human ego works. That's the reason I'm able to record this on a webcam today. Why humans have got to this place of exceptional performance relative to where we were hundreds of years ago. Because there's always going to be a striving for more. And we fall into this trap of thinking, if I could just shave off a few seconds here and there, then everything would be better. I don't buy that. I don't think that's how it works. And my experience of that is proves exactly that. And yes, it'd be nice to master those little bits of time where I'm scrolling on my phone. But there's always going to be something that has to be sacrificed. You will have to give something up. You cannot have it all. And in a way, that's what adds so much value to life is the fact that you then have to prioritize things. If we had a thousand years to live, then there'd be no pressure. There wouldn't be, we still wouldn't get everything done because it's that pressure that forces us into action that makes things more meaningful. That's one number one is to pay yourself first when it comes to time. If things are truly important to you, then you have to put those things in first. I see this so often with exercise, people saying to me, if I had more time, then I would do more exercise. You say to them, well, do you have 15 minutes? Yeah. Well, have you done any 15 minute workouts? No. The things that are important to us, we make time for. And if you aren't making time for those things at the moment, then that's what you need to do. You have to put these things in first before something else. And then accept that on that conveyor belt, if you put something at the front, it's going to push something else off the end. And that is a necessary sacrifice in order to get the things in that are important for you. So often you see this with work. You say, I'm doing this for my family. And then their work takes up this massive chunk of time, which means they don't have time to see their family. And you think, that doesn't work. That, you know, that's, that's a lie. You're lying to someone. You're either lying to yourself or you're lying to your family or you're lying to the person you're talking to, telling them that family's number one. And I think that's a really good concept to, to take on. As long as I'm only fantasizing, I get to imagine all of them, multiple goals, unfolding simultaneously and flawlessly. The example he used in the book, again, related almost a mirror image to me. I want to be a marathon runner. I want to be a good partner. I want to work hard in my business. I want to have time to rest. I want to spend time with friends and family. And in my mind, I can visualize doing all of those things at once. And that feels really nice. It feels good to believe that that is possible and that is true. But the reality is it's not. And the longer I let that fantasy go, the more I'm going to miss out on because I'm not going to make the necessary sacrifices and I will have, you know, I'll be doing a 50% job across all of those things. And that means that the thing that is most important to me, I'm only getting 50% of. Whereas the things that aren't as important to me, they are taking time away from those, those priorities. And so it's so important to recognize that this dream is hindering you, this idea that you can manage your time perfectly and have everything that you want. Capitalism is a giant machine for instrumentalizing everything it encounters in the service of future profit. So when we look at the why behind this, why do we live in the future? Why do we give up so much today in order to get something tomorrow? And it's because, in large part, we live in a capitalist society. We have grown up with this idea that if I work hard now, then I can retire and live a nice future. And that seeps into our subconscious and we act this out without ever deciding it. And it's very easy to think, well, that's just the way it is, or this is how I am. But it's not. If you grew up in the jungle or in the desert, then you would have a different perspective on life. This is something that you have taken on board subconsciously and you can now choose as an aware adult to let go of that. And if you're telling yourself you can't, 
that's because you've got a closed mindset around this and recognizing that this is the society that we're in, but there are parts of this you can choose to let go. There are sacrifices you have to make if you do that, but this is something that you can step away from. And it's baked into the very fabric of, of Western culture. Midlife is when many people become consciously aware that mortality is approaching. It becomes impossible to ignore the absurdity of living solely for the future. This is something I'd never recognized. You know, as somebody who is 33, um, I would say a reasonable way away from having a midlife crisis. But it made perfect sense that people get to this point <clears throat> when their friends and their parents start to, to die. More often people stop having children. It becomes clear that um, you might not make your pension age or that it just doesn't make sense to constantly think about living for tomorrow. Johnny Wilkinson talks about this really good, really well talks about it really good brilliant english nice one in that one of the big things people talk about is legacy you know you're not even living for the rest of your life you're living for what people think of you after you're dead you know how absurd is that that we would put all this effort in and then what if your kids do that and your ki children's children and your children's children's children everybody then is just constantly living for somebody else at a future time that you never get to see what's the point is that the purpose of life you know if, if my child said to me, do you know, I'm just going to sacrifice everything so that my child can have a nice life. I'm like, what's the point? What are you doing? You need to get some pleasure from what you're doing today. I'm not saying, you know, live as if it's your last day and spend all your money. But tomorrow isn't guaranteed. And so we need to, to call into question some of these decisions that we're making and the thought processes we have and ask if they're really serving us. People have been responding not with satisfaction or all the time saved. With increasing agitation, they still can't things, make things move faster still. Every mind, reminder that, in fact, we can't achieve such a level of control starts to feel more unpleasant as a result. So he was talking here about time-saving culture and this idea that when we got white goods and better cleaning implements, that rather than enjoying the time it saved, we just raised our standards of cleanliness. And he talks here about how patience or being patience is a virtue and that in modern society being impatient sorry being patient is almost seen as a weakness that you'd be willing to wait for something and if you look at the amount of agitation that people have when things don't go their way that make no difference if you walk around any city or even town at 8 30 9 a.m and all the horns that are going off and people getting angry about things that they can't change it's just absolute madness Think of all that discomfort and happiness that people are falsely opting into when you can just let it go. And actually, when we're reminded then that we don't have this control, it's frustrating. And that's the problem, because rather than accepting the situation, our fake people get angry and they shout and they yell and they cause themselves stress. and They do this minute after minute, day after day. And that ends up being their whole life. And rather than recognising what we do have, people keep striving for more more time efficiency, more convenience. And there are sacrifices that, and there are negatives that are involved in that. Speed addicts must surrender to the reality that you can't quiet your anxieties by working harder. And this ties into the, the bit at the start about how busy culture is praised as hustle and this thing that's a massive win. It's very common for people, you know, work is a coping mechanism for a lot of people in a way that you know, society rejects alcoholics and drug addicts but it's quite happy to celebrate people who work really hard. And actually there's a lot of people who aren't dealing with their problems and they're just going into work day after day, month after month, in order to not have to deal with their, with their shit. What do you make of that when you think about it? If you saw someone working 60 hours a week, you know, think about all the people. I've, I've always looked up to people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and all those things. But what if they were truly unhappy? I don't know them personally, obviously, hence why I've got such a basic looking video and podcast set up. But what if I found out that they were just super anxious and happy and they were doing this to, in order to right some wrong in their head? It's not that I respect them less, but I wouldn't want to swap places with them. I'd rather be content with less. You know, the whole point of having more is that so you feel, so you enjoy it. And if it's not giving you what you want, if it's a coping mechanism for a discomfort, then surely it makes more sense to tackle that discomfort we need to develop a taste for having problems a life devoid of problems would contain nothing worth doing i fall into that trap as i mentioned before about my idea of getting getting everything off the table and being able to just go on holiday all the time 
then there's no purpose. There's no conflict. I'm just existing. Actually, one of the things that gives me great pleasure is solving problems, is helping people. The reason I'm making this video is because I want to help people who've got problems or who have had similar problems to me. If I take away all those problems, I take away my my purpose and I'm just existing. And actually, if we develop this taste for problems, then we live a life that's more enjoyable. Grandiosity takes the form of the belief that each of us has some cos cosmically insignificant life purpose, a liberating truth that what you do with your life doesn't matter all that much. I have had, I'm going to admit this somewhat embarrassingly now, this idea that I'm destined for great things. And this is the, he talks about it in the book, about it being a beneficial trait for human development in that we need to think that what we do is important, because otherwise, why would you bother trying? But that also creates a huge amount of pressure. You know, why am I scrolling on my phone in the evening when I should be working towards this, this grand purpose that I've got of changing the world? Not everyone can change the world. In fact, 99.999, you know, to a lot of nines, of people will have absolutely zero impact on the world and this can be a cause for pain or it can be a cause for celebration this can be liberating this can be i get to choose what to do with my time and all this pressure that comes from time management and optimizing your time and making a difference doesn't really exist it's all in your head it then frees you up to do smaller things because actually caring for an elderly relative or doing some good in the community that's going to give you quite a lot. It's probably going to give you more than hoarding loads of money and uh, destroying the environment, which ultimately a lot of uh, capitalist practices have done. You know, how much how much good is your job actually doing? How much good are you doing with your life? Are you just helping your family and and, the, and your future generations, or are you having a wider impact? And even if that's just helping five people, imagine if the whole world did that. It's an interesting thought. In summary, then. Time management is destined to fail, is that there's this constant reaching for this moment of clarity and this time when you will feel really good, but it doesn't exist. And actually, we need to choose the parts of life that are most valuable to us and accept that things will fall off as a result of that. I hope you found this useful. This is the first one of these I've made. So if you've got any feedback, do let me know. It'd be really, uh, really good to hear. If there's any books you want me to cover, uh, then let me know too. Any ways to make this better, then please let me know because ultimately I'm doing it for the benefit of other people. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day.